Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoy the conference so far. Uh, my name is Yair, and to, to, uh, together with me on stage, we have Igal. And actually, our roots in the industry come from the field of uh, web application security, uh, ranging from the exciting days of Watchfire, and after we got acquired also in IBM. But in the past seven years, uh, our focus has shifted to mobility, mobile security. Uh, I co-founded SkyQ, and Eagle was one of our first employees. And we focus on many areas of uh, mobile security, OS security, network security, and application security. And today what we want to do is actually discuss different repeating coding pitfalls we've identified over the years, uh, how they happen, how they can be mitigated, etc. And we will start with a very quick overview of OS level issues, IDE issues, and then the core of the presentation will be around application security. Uh, towards the end, we will conclude, take a few examples that we cover today, and perform a live demonstration of how those coding pitfalls might be exploited. So let's start with the OS. So obviously, I think that uh, when software is developed, new coding pitfalls arise. And the same applies to any operating system I've ever seen. I can show with you that over the years, uh, we've seen hundreds of distinct security issues publicly disclosed, both for iOS and Android. And because of the great value of security issues in those operating systems, the belief is that the actual number of new vulnerabilities that are being identified and exploited is much higher than what is publicly discussed. Um, so I think that when it comes to OS, it can range from esoteric, very weird glitches, such as the glitch in FaceTime that was identified earlier this year by a 14 years old boy. Uh, that practically allowed to set up a group call in FaceTime and be able to snoop into the microphone and other certain conditions also to the video, even before the victim had a chance to either pick up or hang up. Uh, but I think a more interesting example of uh, a notable security issue in operating systems is GoToFail. So how many of you are familiar with GoToFail? OK, OK. So this is a security issue that was identified a few years ago. Uh, it actually existed in iOS for about 17 months until it was patched. And I think for those of you that develop, uh, it might be very familiar to you from your own history. So what we see in here is, is, a, is a piece of the, the phases of TLS handshake, right? That is responsible for forward secrecy. And this piece of code just have to verify part of the exchange of, of, of uh, the keys. So this is a function. It needs to return 0 if everything OK. If not, obviously, something else. And I think the most, most important part of the code is obviously that function. But if you come to look at this implementation that actually existed in iOS and also macOS, the big problem lies here. It looks like a go, like copy, double paste, right? So because there, is, there isn't any usage of curly buckets, et cetera, what practically happens is that the first go to fail happens if something wrong happened to the update function. But regardless, the second one will be uh, executed uh, if not. That means that the critical code in here doesn't even get executed under any circumstances. And the problem with that is that practically if the first, kind of first list of functions are just OK and not fail, we get into the situation where the function returns 0, presumably verified that phase, but it didn't really. And that kind of mistake actually led to the ability of a man-in-the-middle attacker to not only snoop on the plain text communication, right, but also into the encrypted communication. OK, so uh, a bit on the IDs. So again, another interesting attack from a few years ago uh, was Xcode Ghost. In this case, um, developers, mainly from China, were using a mirror site to download upgrades uh, for their Xcode, uh, mainly because of, uh, of um, bandwidth problems uh, with the official Apple sites. So what happened was that they downloaded an IDE that would uh, inject malicious code after the app was al already built into the binary before it was signed uh, and sent to the App Store for review. 
Now, because at the time, much of the rev review process of Apple depended on uh, reputation, and those apps had hundreds of millions of uh, end users using them, uh, they were approved by Apple and went on the store and all of those users were in infected and it took quite some time until Apple realized it and took them down uh, from the store. Yeah, it's just an anecdote. We've been following those incarnations for many years and even though the initial publication happened end of 2015, to these very days we still see instances of compromised versions of those apps used by people because they didn't update their uh, application versions. So let's jump over, uh, jump over and discuss a few repeating coding pitfalls we have seen constantly come back and back and back. The first one, we call it hospital gown. And I want to give you a quick illustration of why that happens and later on, what are the ramifications. So let's look at this uh, diagram. Let's imagine uh, that we have a development team that develops a photo app. Right? And now the product manager wants to add an ability to upload new photos from the mobile app to the servers, right? So they go uh, to the developer, the developer says, sure, no problem, immediately thinks, no problem, let's just take those files, upload them to S3. He then goes to the DevOps engineer and tells them, I need a way to upload uh, files to S3. DevOps engineer provides a dev user access key, and quickly after, we have a new shiny functionality. The developer incorporated that access key into the mobile app. What's the problem? Comedy of errors, right? Because what actually happens is that now we have a mobile app that any hacker can take, reverse engineer, and extract the keys from. And in this case, what happened is this is a very promiscuous version of an access key that can allow to actually access all buckets in S3. Okay? So usually when we talk about this uh, use case to our colleagues in the industry, they say, wow, that's terrible, that might happen, not likely to happen to me, or not likely to happen at all. And therefore what we decided to do is to actually analyze millions of apps, millions of mobile apps using static and dynamic analysis, okay? and we looked into applications that try to upload stuff to the cloud, cloud storage, Microsoft, Amazon, Google Girls, and others. And we were actually amazed to see a huge amount of applications that did exactly those kind of mistakes, okay? As an anecdote, we looked into uh, applications that upload stuff to S3 and have, you know, the utilization of an access token there, and 46% of those have used tokens that allow access to all buckets, not only the bucket you plan to upload files to, okay? And just to clarify, the ramifications of those findings are actually hundreds of millions of user-sensitive records. The results are actually uh, confidential, sensitive corporate files that were stored in different buckets in the account, but were suddenly exposed because of those mistakes. And we actually came across backups of internal systems, again, that were backed up to those buckets. So let's try to understand why this happens so often. Uh, first thing is, let's look at the default policies of uh, AWS. If you go to AWS and you look for S3, this is what you get, and the default policies, uh, the, the main ones are read-only or full access, and what you might notice is that uh, both of them always rely to all of the buckets, all of the directories, everything. Um, and by using those default policies, this is the usual uh, uh, fail point where, uh, where the developers uh, make the mistake. Now, how you could uh, try and resolve this? First option is to use pre-signed URLs. Pre-signed URLs is a feature supported by AWS where you generate a unique URL to a, sp to a specific file. Uh, it has a signature, it has an expiration date, and it's extremely secure. You can go and upload a single file to that location, and it even goes away after a time. Um, the overhead here is that I'm trying to build something that's scalable, I'm trying to use the cloud, and I still need to talk from the client to the server for each file I want to upload so that I will get this uh, uh, unique URL and permission to upload this file. So uh, let's look at another alternative. Another alternative would be to build a custom policy. Um, this time we will only give the specific permission, in this case 
only upload a single file at a time, and we will limit it to our specific bucket. Uh, of course, we will build such a policy per bucket, and each thing should be used only for the specific purpose. Now, once we do that, we still have one minor issue that uh, you could override files using that uh, same key. Um, you could easily solve this by generating a secret or a random token and adding it to the file name so that others can't uh, either maliciously or uh, uh, by accident guess your file name and override it. Um, another layer of security that you might want to add here to prevent others from making the same mistake that you have avoided uh, is to add the bucket encryption. Bucket encryption allows you to attach a KMS key per bucket, uh, which means that not only do you have to have the specific permission to access files on that bucket and write to that bucket, but you also have to uh, have access to this key, uh, meaning that if someone else uses the default policy, he won't have the key, thus he won't be able to list the files and uh, take them from your bucket that you're trying to secure. Okay, so this was one, uh, one issue I wanted to share with you. Another one relies, uh, re relates to man in the middle attacks. So obviously over the years, uh, man in the middle has become a very prominent discussion in the industry, um, and I think had a very important impact on an industry. On the positive side, we've seen a significant growth in the utilization of encryption, right, in different services uh, and, 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 service, and servers, and that actually is the best key against man in the middle attacks, right? Um, now, when you come to think about what you need to do in order to implement encryption and protect yourself against many the middle attacks, when you think about browsers as an example, you have a situation where the developer of the browser does not know how the users will use it, right? Where will they browse to? Which kind of service they will connect to? And therefore, the challenge is, first of all, before you encrypt, to make sure that the server the client tries to connect to is indeed the server itself, and then obviously encrypt the communication between the two sides. And the challenge just mentioned led to the utilization of the concept of chain of trust, right? Identifying a bunch of third parties, trusted sources, we call, it, uh, we call them root CAs, having them, their certificates already pre-installed or installed by the browser or by the host itself, and then by giving them the responsibility to verify the identity of servers and then mathematically sign on their certificates we have a nice model where the agent, the client, the browser can try to connect to a server, get a certificate, compare the domain to the subject in the certificate, and then just validate that the certificate itself is mathematically signed directly or indirectly by a root CA. That's awesome, that works very, very well. The big problem is that as encryption went up, attackers started to focus on the weak point in that model, which is obviously that list of trusted CAs, right? So what the attackers started to do more and more, either by exploiting security issues or just by social engineering, they just focused on getting a bad root CA into the trusted list, and then from that, that moment, the whole model fails because that allows a man-in-the-middle attacker to provide an invalid certificate that would be signed by the malicious root CA, and from the perspective of the client side, everything looks legit because all the steps I just mentioned uh, are working, okay? Now, let's think about, for a moment about mobile applications. In those situations, the developer of the client is usually also the owner of the critical servers with which the mobile app is communicating with, right? That opens the door for certificate pinning. So again, as developers, we are used to look at the, let's say, the high level. And uh, when we make requests, we look at the responses. This is the data part. We kind of ignore this uh, critical part of the handshake uh, that happens at the beginning. And in order to implement this uh, pinning correctly, uh, we will have to get into this process as well. So let's uh, split it into a few steps. We'll have to hook the handshake phase, be able to look at the specific certificate. We still want to do all the validations that the operating system does for us, uh, uh, making sure uh, that the certificate is actually valid, it signs the correct domain, expiration dates, etc. And uh, the last part will be adding our own 
validation layer where we would uh, compare the specific certificate that we received with a trusted list that our application will maintain, uh, preventing others from uh, uh, going around this mechanism. So a bit about code. Um, let's say we're, we're uh, using iOS and we use URL session uh, in order to make our requests. We can register a delegate and this uh, uh, callback is basically our first step that we mentioned. This is the hook and here we are in the middle of the handshake part. We receive the certificate and we have the ability to either accept or reject the specific certificate uh, and add our own val uh, validations. Second part is the default behavior of the operating system. We just create a default policy, do the SSL validations just as uh, the operating system would. And here the third part is the part where we add our own uh, um, uh, mechanism to uh, try and add the additional validation. So let's look at a couple of interesting implementations for this. First one is uh, taking the whole chain. Uh, in this case, we chose to sign and validate the LEAF certificate. So the zero here that you see is basically the first part, the first certificate in the chain. This is the LEAF. We will generate a fingerprint and compare this fingerprint with a trusted list that our application maintains and needs to be up to date all the time. Um, now, a common problem with that is that it's, again, high maintenance. Uh, we will usually replace our certificates once a year. That means that each time before we upload the new certificate to the site, we need to release a new application in advance. Uh, and uh, for those users that do not often uh, update their application, we need to dynamically pass on the information of the new fingerprint so that the uh, old application is still aware of the new fingerprint that exists. So one other option that we can uh, uh, implement is uh, not looking at the complete certificate, but rather uh, looking at the public key. Assuming that uh, it has not been compromised, we could earn some time and reduce the frequency of replacements of certificates uh, of, uh, of the application uh, by generating for two or three years this, uh, new certificates each year from the same uh, public and private keys. Uh, allowing us to uh, still uh, do the fingerprinting, but uh, not having to update the app each time we uh, replace the certificate. So we've done that and probably uh, some of you are kind of feeling that they're afraid because, okay, I make some mistake, I don't update it in time, I'm getting locked out of my server. Now I have a useless app that can't communicate with my server. Um, so a bit about alternatives to uh, uh, overcome this. Um, one, of the, uh, w one of the suggestions is to use an alternative secure channel that will allow adding temporary, a, a temporary fingerprint uh, in addition to the existing list just to open a single sync with the server allowing us to fetch the full configuration again. So in this case, even if the uh, application didn't get the update in time and the binary was not updated with the new one containing the new fingerprint, we can use a push notification either from uh, Apple's APNS or Google's FCM to just push the new token uh, temporarily unlocking the app with the, uh, to allowing it to communicate with the server. Thanks, Carl. And, and I think that the third example is actually my personal favorite. Um, and, and actually, over this, uh, one of the things I like to do when interviewing candidates is to ask them a very simple coding uh, question. I tell them that uh, they have uh, a zip file that they need to just unpack into the file system. So they have a target directory to which to unpack and they have some kind of object that allows them to iterate over the zip files. And usually I get very similar answers. In this case, you can look at the code from Java to do this. Do this very successfully, by the way. Too much successfully. Um, and they, in natural, what you can see here is an iteration over the zip entries. We've got the destination dir, which is uh, developer controlled, in this case, uh, my app slash target deal. But the problem is that the zip file itself is user controlled, meaning attackers controlled. 
And one of the most trivial things an attacker might do is to create a specially crafted zip file that will contain dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, etc., and practically uh, directory traverse the whole situation. So when you concat the two strings, obviously, we are uh, gaining into a situation where we actually escaped from the target directory and gained arbitrary file write. In this case, we likely just took over the host, right? Um, I think the interesting part about path traversal is that it has been around for decades, okay? So in here you can see uh, FRAC 35. As you can see, it's from 91, and it talks about WWIV. For those of you that are old enough, this is, was a very well-known BBA framework. It's actually still being maintained. And what they've shown is practically path traversal to take over that framework, okay? So this is very old. The interesting part that is even more interesting is that it's still very, very relevant. In the past year, we've seen research by SNCC, uh, another very notable uh, Israeli startup, that actually uncovered a huge amount of current open source frameworks that were vulnerable to this problem and practically compromised the ones that use them. Another notable research was Zipper Down by Pangu that showed a huge amount of iOS and Android apps that were and some of them are still are susceptible to path traversal. We will discuss this uh, shortly. So, how can we fix it? So, usually, uh, the, the uh, approach in general in application security is to just say, you know, this does not look legitimate, right? Dot dot slash is not legitimate. Let's just wipe it away. But one of the big problems in general. Uh, when you sanitize input, as I think all of us know, is that it's very hard to implement and very easy to bypass in many cases. So please raise your hand if you understand why that sanitation is actually a terrible sanitation. Okay. So I'll give you a very simple example. The attacker can just create an invalid path in the zip file. By itself, it will not work, but thanks to the sanitization, it will be transformed into a valid path traversal attack. Okay, so this is a simple example that shows why that's so terrible. So um, let's see how we could uh, solve this problem. Uh, so again, we want to use the correct libraries given to us by the operating system. Uh, in this case, we would like to actually evaluate the final path by looking at the canonical path. Uh, and as long as this final path still remains within our desired destination directory, we're good. Uh, otherwise, we would just fail the attempt to unzip this file. Okay, so uh, let's try to combine several of those pitfalls into a modern use case uh, that happens today. So what I want to look at is a hybrid application. Uh, it has uh, some uh, HTML and JavaScript that is actually used as a website uh, that I use without uh, my uh, uh, mobile application. And it has native code that uh, leverages additional APIs from the device to uh, extend my logic when I want to look at this site. So we'll try to look at the live demo. Just a second, let me set it up. So we have a tradition, it worked, uh, it worked one time outside of uh, 100 attempts. So let's hope it works, okay? Yeah. Okay, just a second. And okay. So we have a phone, I'm uh, not going to attack it yet. I just want to go through the logic of the application. I have an application that uh, is a photo album uh, manager, and I wrapped it with some native code, uh, allowing uh, basically two main interfaces, uh, uh, extensions. One, um, as I don't want to uh, uh, enter my credentials again and again uh, because it expires in the website, I just want the native part to store it and inject it into the uh, web part anytime it needs to. And the second part is, uh, of course, in the web UI, I can 
add an upload button, but it's very cumbersome, and I just want to leverage the native UI to already look at the file system, see that there are new, uh, new photos that have not yet been up, uh, uploaded, such as the example there of the crowd here, and uh, suggest them uh, in a uh, very comfortable way to upload them uh, quickly. So, the phone is already connected to a network that has an attacker on it. I have not started the attack yet. We will start it now. And what I'm doing here is starting um, a model that is going to look for a cache, uh, uh, some cache zip that is loaded from an unsecure source. Um, the developer didn't think there was any problem with that. He's doing the authentication correctly. Everything works correctly. Uh, the cache is just some zip with some uh, images to have a quicker startup. Um, so let's kill the app and reload it. Now the app is going to load the cache again. And what, what we can see here is that there was an injection uh, reported by our attack tool. Um, basically, what it did was to catch this zip that was uh, passed and inject uh, malicious code, malicious JavaScript code uh, uh, with a file name that leverages path traversal as we've looked at the application and we know that it is susceptible to uh, um, uh, path traversal attacks. Okay, so now look, at, now let's look at the command and control console, just a second. Okay, so the first thing that we can see here is that I've already uh, caught the credentials. But the interesting part here was that I didn't leverage any network attack during the authentication. Uh, again, the authentication was secure. I was not able to uh, uh, catch the credentials at that phase. But what our malicious code that was extracted did was actually to take hold of the bridge between the web view and the native part of the application, listening in on any events being passed through either side. Um, so the first thing that we did was to take ho uh, hold of the credentials, but now we have access only to the web part. We want to do something more interesting. We want to actually go and run something on the native part of the application and taking hold of photos that never left the device. So if we send our command to the device, okay, we start getting uploads of photos uh, that have never left the device. Um, so let's go back to the presentation and have a quick summary of this demo and understand what happened here. Again, we have a man in the middle, he sits on the network, he sees the request for a zip that is not secure. He catches this zip, this zip just contains a list of files, and we inject some malicious code using, again, path traversal. Again, the interesting part here was that using this malicious code, we were actually able, through the web view, to trigger and run native code that uh, uh, we should never have gained access to from the web. And I think there was a lot of discussion over the years about the value of bridges, of hybrid apps, but I think it's a good incarnation, a good demonstration for the additional risk of having that model of bridges, etc., and the importance of having proper secure coding within them. Um, so to summarize, I think uh, we discussed a few examples, and many of them uh, are actually repeating problems over many years. So many people like to talk about this area as a never-ending problem. But I think there are specific things we can do as an industry to really reduce the damage of those kind of problems. So first one is obviously education. I think uh, from experience, those problems happen a lot, but once people see them and, and learn very quickly about them, it becomes trivial not to fall for that. And I think our responsibility is to make sure that in our organizations, we repeatedly provide presentations, such as this one, where we cover the common coding pitfalls and make sure that any developer in the organization has this in mind. We've seen this as a very paramount process to reduce those kind of problems uh, in our organization. 
Uh, another thing is that I, I didn't touch this earlier, but when you would go and look at many of the processes, like even unpacking a zip file, you will go to Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow provides great solutions, simple solutions. The problem is that even to these very days, you will find a lot of implementations that are just vulnerable. So just copying text from there is really risky. To conclude, there is something we believe that the vendors themselves can do, and that is the importance of secure by design, secure by default. Egal mentioned earlier uh, the configuration in cloud services that by default might lead us to make mistakes. The same applies for path traversal. If you now go to Java, uh, you still have just a way to implement what we just shown, even though the need to unpack zip files is extremely common. And our expectation is for vendors to provide a default way to just, as an example, 